Harris Creek, good morning. All right, all right. Uh, we are moving this week, uh, God willing, my wife and I. We've been building a house, so it's been long anticipated this specific week. We are excited. It's a neighborhood that we lived in before, and we're excited to go back because uh, we have friends there. In fact, you know, all around us are Harris Creek people, and so right beside us is a Harris Creek family. Across the street is a Harris Creek family, and kids are always riding their bikes and their scooters. And, and in fact, the other day, uh, our neighbor was riding a golf cart and dropping some kids off at school and, and then coming back around and uh, had stopped at a neighbor's house. And it was all good because, you know, she's a responsible driver, knows what she's doing. But, but then, kind of in the midst of that, another driver climbed behind the wheel. In fact, watch this. Eddie. Yeah, when, you know, just kind of sneaks up in there. And so, uh, you know, there he is kind of ready. And, and so when you have a different driver, someone not qualified to drive, you never really know what's going to happen. And so you're kind of looking at this, you're thinking, man, what could go wrong? Well, watch this. Absolute chaos. Uh, pretty, pretty chaotic. If you, in case you don't recognize them, that's Drew Greenway's kids. Uh, uh, my, my kids were tired of me using them as illustrations, so I've had to venture out a little bit. And, uh, and I'm impressed by Paige and just how cool, calm, and collective she was able to stay as she brought order to that. But when someone else drives who's not qualified to drive, you experience a wreck. I'm, I'm uh, you know, excited to, to tell you that no one was hurt by that, except the garage door, which did need to be replaced. Uh, but everybody is, is safe. It, it brings me to my point, though, to ask this question, who is driving? Who is driving? And we're not talking about golf carts. We're talking about this, your mind. Who is behind the steering wheel in your mind? Okay? Your mind is one of the most important things about you. Your thoughts start here. Your plans are created here. Your steps are determined here. Memories are stored here. Conversations are planned here. Feelings are born here. And, and sin, sin is contemplated here. Really, the entire trajectory of your life and the choices that you make, we'll start here. Who's in the driver's seat? And that's the question that we're going to contemplate today as we continue in Romans chapter 8. If you have the wrong driver, you will end up in a wreck. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I have trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe that my sins were paid for on the cross and that I will be with God forever one day. His Holy Spirit lives with me. God's Holy Spirit, the same one who resurrected Jesus from the dead, lives in me, showing me the way to go. I belong to him and... I desire to sin in my thoughts, in my words. When someone does something that I perceive to be stupid, when someone hurts me, I, I have a desire to seek revenge, to get the upper hand. There's a part of me that, that my thoughts can be prideful. I can wonder what you think of me. I can care way too much uh, of your opinion of me. Uh, there's a desire in me to look and to give uh, freedom to my lustful thoughts. There, there's a desire in me to act out on sinful ideas that are born up here. There's a desire in me to drink too much. There's a desire in me to cope by, by spending and buying things that I think are going to satisfy something in me. Those two realities sit right there side by side. That's the truth. 
They are right there, side by side. God's Holy Spirit lives in me, and there's still something in me that desires to do something that's bad for me that the Scripture is going to call me to put to death. If I let my flesh drive, I end up in a wreck, or I wreck my life. We're in Romans 8, a series we're calling More Than Conquerors. Last week, we looked at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, really starting in Romans 7 to set that up, just this idea of we no longer follow the law, but we follow the Spirit. God's Spirit lives with us, and He is directing our steps. And so what does it mean that Christ fulfilled the law? This is what we talked about last week. This week, we are in verses 5 through 13, where I'm asking the question, who is driving your mind? Um, the first idea I'll put before you is the fight for the driver's seat. And then we'll talk about the driver, how the driver determines your destination. And then before you leave here this morning, I'm going to ask you to determine a driver. You, you will choose your driver before you leave today. And so just as a reminder, Paul wrote this letter from Corinth. Uh, he wrote it to Christians in Rome, both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians alike, uh, in a tumultuous culture of Rome to bring unity and peace. He penned this letter. It's rich with theology, and we have just diving verse by verse into one chapter. That is Romans 8, and I'll start in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You know, so written a couple thousand years ago, still so true. Okay, you wake up and you're a weekend warrior. You think about, man, this, this Friday, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? If, you're, if your mind is set on your flesh, how am I going to get more? Hey, I need to close that deal. What am I going to buy with those things? Or if your mind is set on the Spirit, man, man God, it's just so good. God is so good right now. And his word is just, it's, it's producing something positive in my heart. I'm just meditating on the scripture. And God, you want me to go and talk to them and share the gospel? Because I'm, I'm on mission for you, right? I'm going to be with you forever in your kingdom. And it's, it's different. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Flesh is not really a word that we use often, you know, unless we're talking about you know, the, the, our skin, right? In, in this context, flesh means your sin nature. Your sin nature is the part of you that desires to sin. It's the part that doesn't want to honor God or go the way of God. It's the part that is self-reliant. It hates authority. It hates accountability. It is selfish and self-seeking. It's the part that wants to, to peel back and to hide. You're in life groups. Someone say, hey, wait, so why, why did you do that? And you're like, wait, 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 what, what? And all this, you're on the defense. And because, and why are you asking me that? And I don't understand. If you haven't seen that, you will. Because we're messy. And you know that part of you, when, when someone of the Spirit leans in, and it feels threatened, your flesh feels threatened, and you go on the defense. It says governed, the mind governed by the flesh, governed by the spirit here in NIV. Uh, that's the, the Greek word phronema. And phronema, is, it only shows up in Romans 8 four times. And it, your, your NASB is maybe translated like, fleshly minded or spirit minded it's it's what your mind is set on he says those in the realm of the flesh they're hostile to god they're at war with god they can't please god they don't have his spirit your atheist friend he, even when he does something or she does something that you perceive to be good, you, you don't. It's the spirit of God's not at work there. It's it's either done for selfish reasons or we can't understand. But it's not like he can. It's not an offering to God. God is not pleased in it because God, who sits outside of time, like he lives in eternity. 
And so he's not like, oh man, that's, that's so good that you helped that person across the street. It, it brings him no glory if, the spirit, if his spirit is not at work. My first point is there's a fight for the driver's seat of your mind. There is a fight for the driver's seat of your mind. You can see it like a fight. Like you've seen this scene in a movie, right? Like there's a car chase or something. Someone's at the driver's seat. Someone else is kicking in the, the window, trying to get in there. They're fighting. Maybe there's weapons involved. They're fighting over the steering wheel. The flesh and the spirit both seek to be behind the steering wheel of your mind that takes you places. If you are a believer, a follower of Jesus, you have two options of a driver. Your flesh can drive, or the spirit can drive. You have options for destinations, life and death. If you are not a believer, the spirit cannot drive. You, only your flesh drives. The, your flesh is the motivator of every, behind everything you do. Does it feel good? Do I enjoy it? Do I want to? As for your primary motivator, if you're not a follower of Jesus, do I want to? A believer, it's God, what would you have me do? That's different. Lord, I want to do whatever honors you. What would you have? And sometimes it doesn't even make sense. Like, as a non believer, pragmatism is just about all you got. You know, it's like, I'm just going to do what makes sense. Or what helps me have the most gain. As a believer, it's very different. It's God, I want to do whatever you desire me to do, which may not make sense to the world. It may be different than what the world would have me do. If the enemy can win the mind of a person, he can keep them from the pleasures of God. Would you think about that? If the enemy can win the mind of a person, he can keep that person from the pleasures of God. And so what realm does the enemy play in? What does he appeal to? Your flesh, your sinful nature. It's the part of you that just wants to do whatever you want to do. It's, this is familiar to me. As I read this passage, this might resonate with you. I was the youngest of four. I was the baby. And so there was a time where all of my siblings are off. They're grown up and I'm still home with my parents who are just about to be empty nesters and they start traveling more, you know? And, and so they're going fishing and hunting and in Colorado and seeing things and, and they would leave me back. And I can remember very vividly just kind of being in high school and mom and dad saying, all right, well, we're leaving. And they go and just the sound of that door shutting. And then I would go to the living room window where I could see them driving down our dirt road. And it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can go wherever I want to go. Like what, I, can, I can go to dad's liquor cabinet. I can have some friends come over. It's just like this sense of like the freedom to drive wherever I want to drive. And I remember that feeling. And in fact, it showed up a few times in my life. Another one was when they dropped me off for college. We were here in Waco. My mom and dad are helping me move in all my belongings, which was a suitcase and a box. And we put it in my apartment. And then, you know, mom has some tears in her eyes and says goodbye and with a hug. And then they go into the parking lot and drive off. And it's like, ho, ho, ho. I have the freedom to do whatever I want to do, to go wherever I want to go. I, I can drive. And I can remember then as a young adult, this guy's weekend. Where are we going to go? We go to Shreveport. We go to Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You get to Vegas and it's just one more. It's just like, I can go anywhere. I can drive anywhere. And then as an adult, you travel for work. You get in a hotel room of some city you haven't been in before. You're on the seventh floor there at the Holiday Inn, and nobody knows you're there. And you've got a TV in your room, and all kinds of information coming in through a pipe in your room. You've got a bar across the street. Nobody knows you're there. And if you do something, no one's ever going to know. God knows. 
and you're going to know for the rest of your life. And as you try to keep that a secret, it's going to rot you from the inside out. And, and it's going to impact you in ways you never thought that it would. And before you know it, you're walking around the shell of a person where you have half of your being outside here and half of your being inside here, just trying not to get caught. Right? It's not freedom. It's not freedom. It's the opposite of freedom. When the Spirit is driving, the freedom is better. I have the freedom to share Jesus. I have the freedom to love my wife. I have the freedom to be a, a great dad to my kids and, and to make memories with them. I have the freedom to, to walk up to somebody and just meet a need. Say, hey, what are you? I got you. Like, I'm here. I'm one of God's agents and I'm living a life that matters with purpose according to His Spirit. That's different. That is different. The reality is your flesh is a terrible driver. Your, your flesh would love to drive right now. And your flesh is a terrible driver. Uh, when Weston was about six years old, I think we had watched that like Dude Perfect episode where they had RC cars, you know, and I, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but it, long story short, I wanted an RC car, a remote control car. Uh, I really wanted one as a grown man. And, uh, and so I did what any great dad would do. I convinced my son to want one. And, um, and I said, hey, you know, if you do this, I might get you one. And so, uh, you know, it came down to, for him to get one. And and I said, what kind do you want? And he said, a red and a gray one. So I had a lot to work with, you know. And so he and I, we go to the, to the RC store, the hobby shop, and we're looking for cars. Like I told the guys, I had like to, to get one. We're getting a car for my six-year-old. And he's like, son, sir, we don't really sell cars for six-year-old. I go, yeah, I'm going to help him. Okay. And so, you know, what kind do you have? And and so, you know, he's like, I said, it needs to be red and gray. And so that kind of limited it down. And we chose one. And I don't know if you know what you know about RC cars, but the game has changed since when I was little, right? Like these things are like machines. They go fast and they're powerful and, and really fun. And, and so we get it home, you know, and, and we're there in, in front of the house. It's like, zoom, I'm driving, zoom, do a... Zoom, just do a little donut turn around and Weston's right there like dad let me drive let me drive when can I drive when can I drive I'm like what do you think it's yours you know and <laughs> and I'm like all right so finally he wears me down like, all right you know here you go but be careful okay be careful it's expensive you know and so he he gets behind that that remote control I mean he he cuts right turns left right into the curb 30 pieces you know it's like oh man but it's okay it's hobby grade you can fix it so we take it inside we get the tools, we, we repair the car, we go back outside, I'm like, zoom, 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 I'm driving, and he's like, Dad, let me drive, we're gonna drive, let me drive, let me drive, I was like, but last time you're doing this, let me drive, let me drive, let me drive, okay, man, but be careful, he gets behind it, cuts left, turns right, right into the curb, explosion again, I'm like, come on, man, <laughs> take it back inside, fix it up, go back outside, I'm driving, zoom, 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 I'm I'm driving. He's like, let me drive, let me drive, let me drive, let me drive. I'm like, but you're going to wreck it. He's like, no, I'm not. I learned my lesson, you know. <laughs> I learned, I'm not going to. You can trust me. Okay, here you go. He gets the remote control, cuts right, turn left, right into the curb, million pieces, can't be repaired. That's broken. And the Lord used that moment because he's just like, that's like you, JP. And that's what you, let me drive, Spirit, let me drive, let me drive, Spirit, let me drive, 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 come on, man, me, my turn, my turn, my turn, come on, let me go, let me go where I want to go, let me do what I want to do, let me see what I want to see, somebody, somebody threatens me, hey, let me respond how I want to respond, you know, let me, let me drink what I want to drink, let me experience what I want to experience, let me buy what I want to buy, I want, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, let me drive, let me drive. He's like, but man, every time you do that, it's, it's a wreck. No, I learned my lesson. This time's different. And what I really want to do, and I don't know if you connect with this, I really just want to go hands off the wheel. Hey, let's just see where this goes. Let's just see where this goes. I'm just going to, you know, see what that is. Okay, no, I'm not driving. It goes to a wreck every time. 
to a wreck. Who is driving determines where you go and what you do. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. This is a new category of person, not the one who's hostile to God. And I love the way the Holy Spirit through Paul just speaks this over you. You, however are different. That's not who you are. You're different. He just says it. He just, like, just declares that over you. Not you. You don't live in the realm of the flesh. You live in the realm of the spirit. The spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Non-believers, they can't honor God. They, they, their job is hostility. That, that is their job description. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because of whose righteousness? Is he saying the Spirit gives life because you're going to do good? No. Because of Christ's righteousness. Because of what Jesus did. His righteousness imputed on you. His righteousness covering you, overwhelming you. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Guys, the same spirit who got Jesus up. I mean, pulled him out, rolled the stone away. That same spirit lives in you. And you, you sit in this place, you're like, but you don't understand. I'm so entangled by sin. Like God's like, oh, whatever will we do? You know, really stumped with this one, never seen this before. No, it's the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Your driver determines your destination. That's my second point. Your driver determines your destination. So you have two possible destinations, life and death. Now this is under the sun and, and beyond the sun, right? So under the sun, uh, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God can take you to life and peace. That's a destination outlined in the scripture, life and peace. Or you can follow your flesh, which will always lead to death. Now, that's a death under the sun we're talking about. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, then after this life, you only experience death. We know that as hell, uh, a place where there is nothing good uh, of any kind. Uh, or to life forever with God, a place that we call heaven, paradise, in the presence of of God. And so the flesh desires to kill you because everything it wants hurts your relationship with God, which gives life. And so what does that mean, death under the sun? What, what do we mean by that? What does that look like? Anxiety, depression, despair, fear, insecurities. Uh, it, it can look like exhaustion, hangovers, Pregnancy scares. Uh, it can look like heartbreak, guilt, shame, apathy. It looks like a life without purpose. That's the death that the flesh will lead you to under the sun. But the spirit leads to life and peace. That's verse 6 and verse 10. It, you have this driver that desires you to have life and have it abundantly and fill your heart with peace. This, the, it's the spirit that resurrects the dead. You can trust him, and the benefit of trusting him is life and peace. And, and so what does that look like? You, you surrender to God's spirit, and what, is, what marks your life if, if God's spirit is driving your mind? You tend to be more loving. Uh, you tend to be more joyful. Uh, you tend to be more filled with peace. You tend to be more patient. You tend to be more kind. You tend to be more good or, or better, more good. Uh, you tend to be gooder. Um, you tend to be more faithful. 
you tend to be more self-controlled because the spirit is driving, right? I, I have a dear friend and he got saved at church camp and then he went to Baylor for college, graduated from Baylor and uh, moved to Austin, got married there, uh, was successful kind of marketing director there in Austin. And he and his wife loved to party, and so that's kind of where, what they had in common is they would just kind of go out in all the places that Austin has to offer. And they would party in the midst of them partying, kind of both you know, developed a dependence on alcohol. And in the midst of being dependent on alcohol, both committed adultery, had affairs. And so now my, my friend, right, he's, he's in this place where his flesh has just been driving. And, he's, and he, he comes to this place where he's now divorced, uh, he is an alcoholic and he's looking at his life and there's just really, he, he can't find any hope in the midst of it. And so he loads up a 12 gauge and he's going to end it all. And believers, as God would have it, um, reached out to him, came around him and said, you, however, that's not who you are. Remember, remember this, remember this truth. This is the spirit of God lives in you. And the spirit of God began to do a work, right? And so now, you know, his, God's done a makeover on his life. And he just called me this week. He left me a voicemail. And he was just like, man, I was at Walmart. And this couple behind me, they were buying a car battery, but they, they didn't have any money. And, and they were just down and out. And I got to buy their car battery and share Jesus with them. And he was just so excited. And, and in fact, listen, here's some of the voicemail. I said, hey, bro, can I, can I talk to you real quick? And he looked at me like, what are you about to say? And I paused and I was like, man, I used to be an alcoholic for like more than 10 years. And Jesus saved me. And you know, now, now I've been sober 16. And I went from having a gun to my head to having this kid with me and two other kids and a wife at home. And God did all that. And anyway, I was just... I was just wondering if you'd allow me to get your battery, but it's, but it's not from me. The only, the only thing you got to know is that it's not from me. This is from God. It's from Jesus. And I feel like he would have me get it for you if you'll allow me that. And he just looked at me dumbfounded and started wiping away tears from his eyes. And I was like, you understand, right? Like, this is not from me. It's from the Lord. And so, and so it's like he calls me and he's just excited and he's just sharing like, hey, here's an opportunity God just gave me. And then he's like, and I was with my son. And so we got to talk about discipleship and, and why we did that. And I shared the gospel with this couple. We got to celebrate the work that Jesus did. And bro, it was just so much fun. It's just so much fun. And then I went home and, and my wife and I, we just talked about all evening, the opportunities that God gives us to be on mission for him wherever we go, even in the store. And it's just so much fun. Don't you see what happens when the spirit drives? Now, this is a guy that has drank deeply from the well of the world. And he's telling you, this is so much fun. Oh man, I remember 6th Street waking up with hangovers next to strangers. This is so much fun. It's just better when the Spirit drives. It's better in every way. It leads to life and to peace. But, but for so many of us, like when we say the Spirit drives, it just means, yeah, well, don't rob banks and don't kill people. No, no, there's like this offensive, like wherever you are, you're on mission and you're looking with the eyes of the Lord to see what he would have you do, who he would have you engage with, who he would have you share with, who, who, what he would have you, you know, need, he would have you meet. That's life. That's, that's just better. Why wouldn't we do that every day? Come home every day with a story. Man, you're not going to believe what God let me do today. Spirit was driving. It was, man, it was so much fun. Therefore, verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. This is, um, this is kill or be killed language. Okay? This is, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, 
you will live. The flesh will kill you, so by the Spirit, kill the flesh. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. And it says you have an obligation, but that obligation is not to the flesh, it's to the spirit. That word obligation is actually the word for debt. It's the same word that shows up in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so he's saying you have a debt, but your debt is not to the flesh. He's saying you don't owe your flesh anything. You don't have to listen to it. It's not the God of you. You owe the Spirit everything. You have an eternal debt to the Spirit. Allow it to be God of you. Do everything it says. What he's saying is is important though too because it's, it's essentially you will never have to sin. Like you're never going to be in this predicament where you can choose A, sin, or, and B, sin. Those are your only two options. No, there's always a, a path that the Spirit wants to lead you, which is not sin. It's life and peace. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He's, he's going to show you another way. But you have to determine the driver. This is my third point. Determine a driver, the flesh or the spirit. Determine a driver. There's this Cherokeean proverb. And it's like one of those stories, like your grandmother forwards you in an email, you know, kind of thing. But, and there's something great about it and there's something not so good about it. And I'll tell you both. But it's this, the story goes that a grandson is talking to his grandfather and he just says, grandfather, why is it so difficult to do good, but so easy to do what is wrong? And the grandfather says, son, inside of you, there are two wolves fighting. Now, one of the wolves is angry and full of vengeance, uh, wrath, greed, jealousy, and hate. And the other wolf is loving, joyful, full of peace, patience, kind, good, gentle, and self-controlled. And the grandson says to the grandfather, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. Okay, the one you feed. What I don't like about that story is theologically... It presents a case for dualism. Dualism is a theological term that kind of good and evil are equal and opposing forces. And that's not the case. That that is not what we believe. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not like there's Satan and there's God and they're at war and God's like, oh gosh, check me. No, no, there's God and then there's Satan. and, And Satan is a minion to God at best. But what I like about the story is the application, the one you feed. The one you feed grows stronger. You feed your flesh, and your flesh will grow stronger. The appetite for you to wreck your life will get stronger. You feed your spirit, and the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead will make you stronger. Okay. So that application of that story, I love to give it to you from a scripture. Before I do, let me say this. I've said this before, but it's important. This is the lie of one last time. Okay? I'm going to call him one last time. I'm going to drink that one last time. I'm going to smoke that one last time. I'm going to go there one last time. I'm going to do that one last time. I'm going to look at that one last time. See, when you feed it that last time, that flesh got bigger and stronger, so it's more difficult the next time. Instead, by the Spirit, say the last time is behind me. You do not need closure with sin. Just, it's closed. It's behind you. Move on. By the Spirit, move on. Here in Galatians 6, he says it like this. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So if you find yourself in this place where you feel stuck in sin. I imagine that's some of you. You're like, man, I just, but I don't, 
I'm doing the thing I don't want to do. I'm, insecurities have grown to such a place where they feel in control. I don't know how not to let my flesh drive. I'm just stuck. I grew up in South Texas and a really nice vacation for us was we would go to Port Aransas. Anybody been to Port Aransas? Yeah, it's kind of beachish. Uh, it's kind of like a beach. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where we would go. I loved it. And because there's something special about Port Aransas. Some, something there you, you can't do in most beaches. You know what it is? You can drive on the beach, right? You can't do that in, in a lot of places. But you can drive on the beach. And so you can imagine when I turned 16, I'm like, oh man, I, I can go wherever I want to go. And I didn't have a car, but my dad, my dad was this cattle rancher. And so he had this this uh, extended cab Chevrolet long bed pickup that he would pull this gooseneck trailer, you know, and it was just, it was the longest truck you've ever seen. I mean, it was so, it was like a, so long and it was standard manual. So it had this big stick shift right there in the middle and, uh, and he would let me take it on the beach. But the problem is there's something with the, the, the length of that truck, the fact that it was standard and the sand, I could not drive that truck on the beach. I would get it stuck time and time and time again. And people would have to come and help me. And you know, the, and, and you get stuck right there in the thoroughfare and you're trying to be this cool 17 year old. Like, What's up ladies? But you're like stuck and everybody's like, get out of the way. And you're like, I'm trying. And, um, and so this one time I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shifted into first, giving it some gas, throwing sand, shifting in reverse, giving it gas, throwing sand. And I'm not going anywhere. And I bury the axle. Now, I got a sense, like, I'm not getting out of there, you know? And so I, I look at my buddy, I'm like, you got to go get my dad. And it's like the, the walk of shame, you know? And, and so he goes and gets my dad. And he comes out there, I'm right there in the thoroughfare on the beach, you know, where the cars are coming. And I'm just, axles completely buried. There's some guys trying to lift up on the bumper, you know? My dad's like this John Wayne character. And he just walks up and grabs that driver's side door. And I'm, I'm in there, and I'm, you know, I'm trying, like, praying like lord be amazing right now if it just you know and he just opens that door and says move over you know yes sir (laughs) okay your truck and he would shift it into reverse give it a little gas shift it into drive and just drive out i'm like what in the world like where did you learn that you know they teach that in school i mean i don't understand (laughs) And I was, that's exactly what I was doing for 37 minutes, you know, and all of a sudden you just drive out of there. It's just like some, like, I don't know, cowboy skill or something. But I, I, it's how I kind of picture the Holy Spirit to your flesh, you know, move over. I'm going to drive now. Okay. You keep getting stuck. You keep wrecking your life. You keep driving to things that are hurtful to you. Let me drive now. In summary, there's a fight for the driver's seat. The driver determines your destination. And so determine the spirit to be the designated driver at all times. Let the spirit drive. I can't read this passage and just be flooded with memories. So for the first half of my existence on earth, I let the flesh drive, you know. What that looked like for me was, you know, always finding identity in relationships with girls, Um, started smoking weed at an early age and started drinking, on into college, which just led to all kinds of addictions. High on the list was pornography, was just enslaved to it. And just all of these these wrecks that owned me. I, I moved to Dallas and was just chasing the dollar, trying to climb the corporate ladder and and finding identity in all of the things of this world while being a weekend warrior, looking for the next party, looking for the next fix, looking for the next outlet the next coping mechanism. I was at a club 20 years ago and I bumped into a friend from Baylor and she said, hey, uh, I said, what are you doing this weekend? She said, well, I'm gonna go check out this church tomorrow. 
I said, great, pick me up. Church, I'm, I like church. Church is cool. And she did. And I went. I remember I had a little mild headache, hung over from the night before. And she really exits the story, but I just kept going to that church. I, I was just hearing truth. There was like something there that, that interested me. There was something new. The, the Lord was doing a work on my heart. And one day, the pastor told this story. Now, mean, meanwhile, like I'm still partying. I'm still doing all the things of the world. But I, Sunday, I'd go to that church. I'd sit in the back row, hungover, and smell like smoke from the night before. And the pastor told a story. And man, God just uses different stories for different people, different places at different times. But whatever, whatever reason, this story, the Holy Spirit just grabbed my heart. And a story about a horse. And, and he said, the horse just wanted to be free to go and do whatever he wanted to do and I thought yes I am that horse and he said that people were trying to capture that horse you know trying to take him home and tame him I'm like uh uh no not me no way and the horse in his freedom had to find food and find water and find shelter from from the weather the elements but when he was free I was like yes free to go wherever I want then there was a drought in the land food supply dried up and horse got weak said this local farmer was able to get a rope around his neck and captured that horse and I'm like, oh no this is not good he took him home and he put him in a pen and I thought no 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 pen and he said he loved him and he cared for him, he provided for him. He said he was able to break him, he was able to ride him. And when he would ride that horse, he would lead him to food and he would lead him to water and he would provide shelter from the elements. And I'm leaning in and this is what got me. He said, it wasn't until he was fully submissive to his master that he truly experienced freedom for the first time in the spirit. I just thought, man, if there is a God and he created everything and he created me and he knows the past from the future, he can see all things then why would I do anything other than exactly what he wants me to do? And I just said, God, I said, you, you take from here on out, from this moment forward, I'm just going to do whatever you ask me to do. In fact, I'm going to search this, this book for instruction to do exactly what you would have me do. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to listen for you to tell me exactly what you want me to do. And from this moment forward, I'm just going to do that. And everything began to change. So I'm going to give you a minute to do the same thing. Whether you're in this place where you're a believer, you've trusted in Jesus, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, but you just know there's some areas of your life where you're letting the flesh drive. Or you're at this place where you're like, man, I've kind of always done what I wanted to do. And I need someone else to drive. So I'm going to pray, but as I pray, I'm going to give you time to pray. And so, Father, we just do that right now. We just ask you to be the driver of our life. Father, would you drive? What I'd encourage you to do is just think about those areas of your life where you know you're driving. I don't know if it's you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at, you're, you're engaged or involved in a relationship you shouldn't be involved in, you're spending in ways you shouldn't, you're, you're coping in ways you shouldn't, you're, you're drinking in ways you shouldn't, you have, you have uh, friends that you shouldn't have because of the way that they're influencing you. Um, it may be some addiction to 
uh, social media or tech or you, you, right about now, you, you probably know what that is. I just want you to bring that before the Lord. Say, Lord, here's where I'm driving. I'm gripping the wheel and I don't want your spirit to drive. I, I am addicted to my flesh driving in this area. And so you say it. You, you think about it. Don't, don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about what other people are praying or who's going to see you pray. In fact, it's really just, it's just you and God in the room. Imagine that you're, you're in this big old room all by yourself talking to God. It's just you and him. Keep thinking about that thing. What is it that you, like a dog to his vomit, run back to or that you've been holding on or maybe it's something you've been hiding Maybe it's something you thought, man, I'm going to take that to my grave. Maybe it's something you just can't stop doing. You, you're so sick of confessing it week in and week out, month after month. You can imagine the Spirit of God just pulling open that, that truck door and just saying, move over, flesh. I'm driving now and just ask the spirit to drive. Just say, hey, would you drive and, and, and express your willingness to, to surrender to God's spirit, to say, I, I want you to drive. Like the desire's there, even though my flesh wars against the, the greater desire of the spirit for the spirit to drive, I, I desire, Lord, would you drive? Would you take me to life and peace? Uh, would you strip me of control and let me trust your control? Help me to believe that you're good and, and just ask God to drive in your own way right now, in your own space, not thinking about others around you. Everyone has their head bowed, their eyes closed, they're talking to God. Don't think about who's beside you or across the room or what else is going on. Just you and God. You talk to God. Take your thoughts back to God and ask him to drive. You don't need to think about how this is weird or different. Just God, would you drive? God, would you drive? you drive. Help me not to be distracted. You drive. Protect me from the enemy. You drive. And then just commit the next time your flesh is tempted to fight for the steering wheel. Ask for strength in that moment to let the spirit drive. Now, it may mean you need to bring something to the light. You ask for courage to do so. Even the part of you, the fleshly part of you, no, 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 you can't do that. Oh, yeah, yes, you can. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. If he doesn't, ask him to. Look at the cross and say, I trust that was a payment for me. I trust that my sins were paid for there. God raised Jesus from the dead, giving me the hope of eternal life. God, would you help us in that way? Would you drive now and forever? We designate your Holy Spirit as the driver of our mind. In Jesus' name, amen.